and I want to thank you for watching today. At Four Winds Church, we're kind of a simple church. We believe the Bible is God's Word, and we think that we should pay attention to it. And I hope that you will pay attention to it as you watch this video, because it's all about Jesus. As you know, uh, we've been celebrating or remembering the season of Advent. Advent, of course, is the waiting period or wait. It's, it's celebrating the waiting time for Messiah to come. And each Sunday, we've been acknowledging a certain part of the, uh, the Christmas story. Uh, we've been lighting an Advent wreath here. And I've mentioned various things about this wreath. The, the fact that it's green is to represent life. Uh, the fact that it's round is to represent eternity. The, the fact that we've got candles there, each one of those candles represents a particular part of the Christmas story. The center candle is the, uh, the Jesus candle, which will light on Christmas Eve. Uh, the first Sunday, we talked about the prophets of the Old Testament. Uh, how they foretold us that the Messiah would come, where he would come from, uh, who he would come from, uh, on and on and on. And it was just amazing all of the prophecies that we saw and how they were fulfilled uh, from the Old Testament through Jesus Christ. The second candle was the Bethlehem candle. We read in Micah chapter 5 verse 2 that uh, from Bethlehem Ephrathah, you might remember we talked about that, Bethlehem, the house of bread, Ephrathah, the place of fruitfulness. That's what it was called before. It was Bethlehem. We went through all of that. You can go back and see that on our YouTube page. But today we're going to light the angel candle. Uh, the angel candle is the pink candle. And the reason that it's a different color than the other ones is because it's sort of, those are celestial beings. Those are beings outside of our, uh, our understanding, outside of our comprehension. And so it's kind of designated as a particular thing. Now I want to tell you that angels are not to be worshipped. They're not to be elevated in some special fashion. They are simply servants of God. They are ones who were charged by God to come and interact with folks to tell them, this is what God wants you to know. If you go to a bookstore right now, you can, you know... Find all kinds of things. I actually saw a bumper sticker one day that said, don't drive faster than your angel can fly. And I'm like, that's dumb. But anyway, um, uh, so, so I hope that wasn't on any of your cars. <laughs> I'll just tell you, that, just take that thing off. That's like still driving around with an Obama sticker on the back of your car. What is wrong with you? But anyway, um, but, uh, but angels are servants of God with a particular calling. They were created at the beginning of creation, and I'm going to blow a hole in a couple of your theologies as well, is that people don't become angels when they go to heaven. Amen. Angels were created. They were established at the beginning of, of, of existence. God created them specifically for a task, and that's to be messengers, and that is to be servants of man. So I just want to clarify that for you, and in this particular case, we're going to be remembering the angels that came and spoke to the shepherds out in, uh, in the fields outside of Bethlehem. So we remember, of course, what was the first candle? You remember that I just told you? Prophet. Prophet's candle. And then what was the second candle? The Bethlehem candle. Very good. I'm such a good teacher that everyone remembers. And then the third candle is the angel's candle, which is what we remember here today. What's that? I get an A. You get an A. Bernice, Bernice was paying attention in class. Very good. So, uh, so uh, those are the candles we'll light today. Next week we'll, we'll remember the shepherd's candle. I'm not going to get into much of them today, but next week we will talk about them. But let's have a word of prayer and ask God to bless this time. Father, as we bow right now, first of all, Lord, we want to we want to thank you for the Christmas story because it tells us of the Christmas Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just thank you for each part that all worked together to prepare. The world to receive him. Even though many folks have rejected him, Father, we don't. We believe that he is Savior. We believe that he is King. And Father, we just pray your blessings on this time together. 
We remember those people who are suffering right now down in the south that endured those tornadoes over the, the past couple of days and how they're trying to put their lives back together. Father, I pray that you would provide the resources and the, and the manpower to, to help them get back into life. And Lord, there's so many things that are going on right now in our world, things that we could focus on, but we want to focus on you here today. We can look at those things anytime. But let us look to you, the author and perfecter of our faith here this morning. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Amen. Turn your Bible to Luke chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Luke chapter 2. It begins and it says there were some shepherds that were outside of Bethlehem. And they were keeping watch over their flocks. They were taking care of them. Like I said, I'll get into that in much more detail next week. But then in verse 9. It says, an angel appeared, uh, the angel of the Lord appeared to them. Now, there have been a lot, of, a lot of speculation about who that is. Some folks will tell you, they'll tell you all kinds of things. A lot of the commentaries that I read said they think it might be Gabriel. But you know what my rule of thumb is? If you don't know, don't say. You know, we don't know who it was. It was an angel given a task by God to say, I want you to go down and talk to those shepherds in the middle of that field, and tell them about, your sa about the Savior. So it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, I'm going to talk about that in, in a little while too, saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. May God bless the reading of his word. Another prayer. Father, teach us this passage and let us know you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can't pray enough, amen? Amen. All right. So the first thing I want to point out to you in this text is, the first thing I want to point out to you is the appearance of the angels. The appearance of the angels. Now, as I said, angels were messengers. They were sent by God. Angels still exist. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that we should uh, just watch who we're actually talking with or interacting with because it may be angels that we're not even aware of. So they still exist. They still uh, they uh, uh, don't necessarily have wings. Uh, a lot of folks talk about angels' wings. and We don't know necessarily, uh, but we can understand that they still exist. But they're not to be worshipped. They're not to be elevated above something else. As a matter of fact, the Bible even says they're a little lower than we are. Why is that? Because you and I have salvation. And that's something they can't even comprehend. Because salvation came to us through the precious blood of Christ. They were created by God. They exist by God. And they are simply servants determined or decided to be sent by God. The first thing I want to point out to you, letter A, is they, became, they came uh, to the shepherds. Look what the text says. There were shepherds living in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them. Now, this is kind of a crazy thing, because people don't really, they would oftentimes, why would the angels come and talk to shepherds about something as amazing as the Savior? I mean, why not priests? Why not the scribes? Why not some kind of king or something like that? Well, it's really pretty simple. The shepherds were the lowliest of the low. They were not respected uh, in, in society. They were like the bottom of the economic ladder. And not only that, but they were kind of outside of town most of the time, so they could never really get to the temple. They were oftentimes ceremonially unclean. Uh, they provided the sheep for the temple, but they didn't necessarily get there. And so they were regarded or recently rejected by God or by people to uh, to uh, to be respected or they were oftentimes regarded as criminals and and shady people they were just not uh, respected very well in the community but I'm reminded of the fact remember what Moses did 
when he uh, first came on the scene, he was a shepherd. And what was he going to do? He was going to lead the nation of Israel out of captivity and toward the promised land. Who else was a shepherd in the Bible? We know King David was a shepherd in the Bible. And he would end up being the ruler over the nation of Israel. So even though these shepherds were the lowliest of the low, I'm reminded of what the Bible says up here that says God chose, in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27 through 29, God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. Now, it's not saying that the shepherds were knuckleheads necessarily, but they, like I said, they were not respected. They would not have been looked to as being some kind of authoritative figure, but God does that on purpose. God says, I'm going to use the simple things of this world to baffle those folks that think they know so much. Look what else the text says. It says, that, no, no, I'm not done yet. Let me finish reading. Sorry. But thank you, though. Thank you. Um, uh, so he says, the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Go, uh, God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world to displease, or despise, to despise things and the things that are not. Why? To nullify the things that are so that no one can boast before them. What's he saying there? Paul says God specifically uses those people that don't necessarily have any kind of stature or any kind of uh, class uh, situation to be utilized by him because they're not going to walk around and talk about how great they are. God uses the simple things. You know what I like about that? Is that God can is chosen the simple things of life to shame the wise, the people who think they know so much, those people that think they've got all this power, then he can use you and I, right? He can take you and I and say, all right, Jeff, you ain't much to look at, and you don't have many brain cells to bang together, but I'm still going to call you and teach, uh, teach the Word of God. And the cool thing about that is, it's His Word. I don't even have to really do anything. I say, okay, God, this is what God says, and we go with it. God does that specifically, because if we thought we were such a, a big deal, we'd sit there and go, oh, look, look how powerful I am, look how impressive I am. God purposely chooses the lowly things of the world to despise things, the things that are not popular or regarded or respected. He chooses those kind of folks to totally blow away those people that think they've got it all together. I like that. And that's what he did. He came to the shepherds. But not only did, they, did he come to the shepherds, but he also uh, comforted the shepherds. The Bible says that they came, the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Now, I don't know if you've seen The Messenger, the chosen Christmas movie that's, that came out. I went and saw it the other night, and uh, it was pretty cool. There's a lot of singing, a lot of phrase songs before they actually get to the little part of the Christmas story. But one of the things that was cool about that movie, and I'm not going to give away the ending. Well, y'all already know the ending. Jesus was born. But anyway... <laughs> So, but I, but I, but one of the things was, is that Mary and Joseph were there, you know, uh, and, and Joseph helps deliver the baby. And I mean, it was intense, man. Uh, you know, when I, when my wife gave, uh, gave birth to my baby, to our babies, I was like, like, like back here, you know, like, go girl, you know. And, uh, and uh, even when she gave a C-section, they put a little cover up there so I couldn't see what was going on. Well, anyway, Joseph delivers this baby, Jesus. And then he, he kind of gets Mary settled and he walks over. And this was so cool. He looks out of the stable and he looks toward the hills. And all of this, this, this is light and all of this glowing stuff and everything. And it was to allude to the fact that the angel was over there talking to the shepherds. And the glory of the Lord was showing across all those mountains. And man, that hit me in the face like a ton of bricks. Because while they were delivering and delivering that baby... The glory of the Lord, God's power, God's essence, everything was being shown to those shepherds. Can you imagine what kind of light show that is? What kind of amazing thing it was? But what was the purpose? Well, the first thing is they came to comfort the shepherds. Now, the Bible says that the shepherds were terrified. I looked up the Greek word, and it says they feared a great fear. That's what that word actually means. It's kind of a double kind of thing. They were scared, scared. That's what they say. You know, it's like something, something you, pick, you pick up a, a coffee mug and it's hot, or sometimes it's hot, hot. You know, that's what we do down in the South. We always repeat ourselves. Well, they feared a great fear. They were terrified. It stresses the intensity of the fear. I mean, they saw, and isn't that what we usually do as believers? 
We fear those things we don't necessarily understand. You say, no, -uh, man. You told us that God gave us a spirit that didn't give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power. We'll look at that in a minute. Absolutely. But we often tell, look at the COVID situation. How many people ran around absolutely terrified? Isn't God still on the throne with all this stuff? Doesn't God still know what's going on? Matter of fact, he knows how that virus is put together. They were afraid. So the angels say, hey, chill out, chill out, chill out. Don't be afraid. We know this is your natural response, but we want you to understand we're here to give you a message. Now, let me explain to you a couple of things. There's other places where the shepherds or where the angels showed up. In Luke chapter 1, verse 11 through 13, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, that's uh, Zechariah, standing right beside the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel of the Lord said what? Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Now, what's the story here? Well, Zachariah's wife is going to give birth to a little guy by the name of John. And he's going to grow up to be John the Baptist. And so Zechariah is, is, is afraid of this angel. He says, don't be afraid. He says, your wife Elizabeth is going to bear a son. And you're going to give him the name John. Another thing that we find here in the text is, is this. Right here. Matthew chapter 1 verse 20. But after he had considered this, the angel of the Lord. Now, let me explain to you what's going on here. I should have told you up front. Joseph has been told, you're gonna, your wife's going to have a son, and you ain't going to be dad. Okay? And Joseph had kind of decided, well, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and divorce her. I'm just going to you know, kind of get her out of my hair because it's embarrassing to me. It's embarrassing to the family. I'll just, I'll just kind of put her away nice and quiet. But again, the angel of the Lord came to Joseph and said, no. He says, he says uh, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Why? Well, because she's actually going to give birth to a baby, and, and that baby's going to be from the Holy Spirit. So you might want to hang in there for a while. I mean, think about that. We were not, or are not to be fearful, even when God asks us to do something beyond what we think we're capable of. I appreciate folks that will step up in this church, and I'm amazed every day, people who basically stand in line to volunteer. And you say, well, no one's ever asked me. I don't have to ask you. I just happen to mention something, and boom. Last night we had a tables and chairs out here and had our dinner. A lot of fun. Folks had a great time. If you couldn't come, I understand. I hope you'll come to our next one. But then we said, okay, we've got to clean up. And, man, it was like a beehive. Zzz, 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 picking up and moving and getting it and all that kind of stuff. And, and everybody's going around and sweeping and all that. And, then, boom, it was done. I'm like, oh. I can't tell you the number of times in churches where I've been the only one moving tables and chairs. And you say, well, that's silly. No, that's not silly. That's God. Because God moves in the heart of people. And people say, well, I can't do this. I may not be able to do, I may not be able to do this, but I know I can do that. And God uses us. It is amazing to me how when we begin to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, it's like the fear just goes away. And you go, okay, Lord, whatever. I'm here. I'm ready. Whatever you say. The Bible tells us this in 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity. The King James Version says fear. He did not give us a spirit of fear. And that's what it is. Fear is a spirit. It, it, it is an attitude. It is a, something that settles in your heart and stays there until you say no more. God did not give us the spirit of, of fear. Then who did? The devil begins to implant that. He begins to get you to question. He begins to get you to be afraid. Oh, what if this happens? What if I embarrass myself? What if I do? Let me tell you a, a quick little story. Because I'm, no, I'm not, I'm, I don't have time. But I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, anyway, there, I, I, I used to be a music pastor uh, a long time ago. And, and, and I went to a little church down in Georgia. First Baptist Buchanan. The church when I was there was 155 years old. I think we still had charter members in the church. I mean, it, that was a joke. You're supposed to say, that Snickers good. I'll go with the Snickers. That's good. Or a Milky Way, either one. Anyway, but uh, but but they but but they had never done. We we went and bought lights for the for the platform, and they're like, wow. I, I thought Georgians would have known what inside electricity was like, but you just never know. So anyway, and so we we did the, and then we went and did a play. We were going to do a Christmas play and musical. And I asked this guy, 
big old fellow. He's since going on to be with the Lord. I said, you know what? God laid upon my heart to ask you to play the lead role. You're going to play a grandfather, and you're going to sing some songs. And he looked at me. His eyes got about that big around. He said, Pastor, number one, I've never been in a play in my life. And number two, he says, I've never sung a note. And I said, well, you and I will work on that, but I really believe you'd be the perfect, perfect person for this. And so we began to work with him. And I'm telling you what, God got a hold of him. And God began to use him. He was simply willing to say, God, whatever, whenever, however. And God began to work in his life. And he stood up there. Not only did he memorize all of his lines, he memorized all of his music. Got up there and sang praises to God. And folks were blown away. Wow. All because he said, yes, Lord, here I am, send me. You just never know. But fear stands alone. He could have gone to me and said, oh, oh, Jeff, wait a minute. I don't speak well. Hmm, I've read that somewhere before. Oh, that's right. Moses said that at the burning bush. He says, uh, Lord, I don't speak well. I can't go and lead anybody out anywhere. God says, yeah, dear, dear, what's wrong with you, boy? He didn't want to say that. That's Jeff's opinion. But nonetheless, when we let fear go away, when we're comforted by the Holy Spirit, it's amazing what God can do. So not only did they, the appearance of the angels happen, but then if you see the announcement of the angels, which is number two on our outline. The, 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 uh, it says, the announcer, look what it says. Do not be afraid. Uh, I bring you good news of great joy. Now, what is that? Well, the first thing here is the good news. What is the good news? The Greek word there, and I know when I say the Greek word, some of you like glaze over like, oh. But it's really important to understand that God, you know, wrote this in the original text of Greek and Hebrew, Old Testament Hebrew, New Testament Greek. Then there's this book called the Septuagint where everything was made in Greek. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, that Greek word there is eulangiazo, which means to announce or preach. It, it basically where we get the word evangelize from. So, so wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you're saying that the angels came to the shepherds and said, I evangelize you to great joy? Yes, that's exactly what he was doing. The angel was coming and saying, I want to give you something that you don't have on your own. So they share with them this good news, the gospel, the message of Messiah. We find there in Luke chapter 3, verse 18, it says, And with many words, John the Baptist exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. The gospel. He evangelized them. I just heard recently that the Pope came out and, and made some decree that the Catholic Church is not supposed to proselytize. It's not supposed to basically convert anybody. It's not supposed to share the message of Christ with the world. Boy, I, I think that's pretty much, they just ought to just, just make that meet, building a museum and, and put a little putt-putt course out front, maybe a water slide in the backyard, and, and uh, you know, that would be fine there because they're obviously not doing kingdom business anymore. God says we're supposed to go out and give the good news to people. And you got the Pope saying, no, I'm not interested. Wow. What about this text right here? This one says, Acts chapter 5, verse 42. Though the disciples were being persecuted, that's my little parentheses there, so you know. They were being persecuted. They list all the persecution, all the things. The Bible says, even in the midst of the persecution, it says, day after day in the temple courts, from house to house, they never stopped Teaching and proclaiming the what? Good news. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news that Jesus is Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. I got news for you. Persecution is only going to increase. It's only going to get greater. And, and if, you don't, if you're not in for that, then just, you just might as well go ahead and jump ship now. Because you're not really saved. But if you know that persecution is going to happen and you're going to stay in there and you're going to fight the fight and you're going to continue to share, then my friends, you will be blessed. I got a phone call last night at 1 o'clock in the morning, some crank call. A guy was trying to say he was some marketing whatever. 1 o'clock in the morning from Maryland. Nobody stays at 1 o'clock in Maryland. Nothing to do it. Wow. <laughs> probably, probably is. And I said, and I said in my sleepy stupor. I've been asleep for a couple hours. I said, dude, it is one o'clock in the morning. Goodbye. Click. Call back three more times. Finally, I blocked him. 
Now you say, well, that's not persecution. Well, for a guy who needs his beauty sleep, it absolutely is. <laughs> All right? But I know this stuff is going to happen. The more we proclaim truth, the more that we go after the devil, the more that we say, thus saith the Lord... The devil's going to turn up the heat. And I'm, I'm telling you, you better be all in. You can't just be part in. Anyone that sits on the fence is going to only end up with splinters. You either got to be on one side or the other. So go ahead and set that in your heart. Share the good news. Let's go to this next verse right here. The Bible says, Peter said this. He said, all the prophets, all the prophets of the Old Testament testify about Jesus, as we're saying, that everyone who believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of sins through his name. That's the good news. That is the good news of Jesus Christ. And that is what the, that's what the angels were bringing here. Remember how we talk about our t-shirts? It's got that I am not ashamed on the front of our t-shirts. Look at what the verse says. I am not ashamed of what? The gospel. That's the answer. When somebody sees me wearing that t-shirt, they say, what are you not ashamed of? Now, when we designed those, it was, of course, it was all the critical race theory and you're supposed to be ashamed of how God made you. And you're supposed to be ashamed of your white privilege and all that kind of thing. You know what I'm not ashamed of? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe. It says, for first to the Jewish person, and then they reject it, and then to the non-Jewish person, the Gentile. I'm not ashamed of that. And I hope it forewinds you that we never get ashamed of that. Because that's the good news. The good news that people need to have. That is the only answer to the screwed up mess of our, of our country right now is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. Not only is it good news, but it's going news. Look what it says. Go to the next slide there. It is going news. What do I mean by that? Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Okay? All people. That means, you mean I should share the good news with a Muslim? Absolutely. You mean I should share the good news with a Jehovah Witness? Absolutely. You mean I should share the, the good news with a Catholic? Absolutely. Because it's not about religion, it's about relationship. And don't assume that anybody has Christ until you have verification. I sat down with the nicest couple I've ever run into in, in, in a long, I mean, y'all are nice, I misunderstand. These are just nice people. They were just wonderful people. I just really enjoyed talking with them. We had lunch together, on and on. I said, so let's talk about Christ. And they went, nope. We're not interested. We have no interest in talking to you about Jesus. I said, but come on. Let's talk to you. Come on. Nope, 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 nope. Not interested. You know, you're going to run into some folks like that. Nice people, wonderful. You want to see them in heaven. At least you want to see them in the church. Nope, 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 nope. I'm good the way I am. No, you're not. You're lost. But it's going news. It's not just good news. It's going news. It's going and telling people. You remember here, Mary told Elizabeth. Remember after Mary got pregnant, she went and said, Guess what, Elizabeth? I am pregnant. And look how Mary responded. He said, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, Elizabeth said, my baby, who's her baby? We just talked about that. That is John the Baptist leaped in the womb for joy. As soon as he got that message, the baby even went, wow, that's awesome. What about this? The, the, wisdom, the wise men came out and they shared. What does the Bible say here? When they saw the star. Now, these are lost guys. These are pagan kings. Saw the star in the east, and what it says, and they were overjoyed. They were overjoyed. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy. I always go back to King James every once in a while. I hope you don't mind that. I just the way I learned it. But anyway, he says, I bring you great news of great joy. For, for you today in the city of David, there is a child that has been born who is Christ the Lord. That's why we see in Luke chapter 2, verse 15, the shepherds say, Whoa. There's something going on in Bethlehem. Let's go. Let's go check it out. You see, it's not just the good news, it's going news. It is news that is going out to the world through the local church. We've had people come here, you know what they said? We've been waiting for you to open. Here in their neighborhood, the, the neighbors right here, we've been waiting for you guys to open. How cool is that? We've been waiting for a church to come here. My question is, why has the church gone there? We're gonna. We're gonna. 
We're going to knock on doors. We're going to talk to people. We're going to, we're going to encourage them in the good news because it's not just good news. It's going news. And that's what the, the, the shepherds did. We'll talk about this next week. They said, the minute they heard the message, hey, man, let's go find out what's going on in the city of David. Let's go see this child that we've been told about. And then you know what they did after that? And I can't get into it much today. You know what they did after that? After they saw that baby, they went and told everybody else. They didn't leave it to themselves. They went out and told the world. Talk about that more next week. So not only is it the, uh, uh, the appearance of the angels and the announcement of the angels, but number three here, it is the accolades of the angels. So this is the next thing, the accolades of the angels. Look what it says. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that is for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior. And it's not like there was a multiple Saviors. It wasn't saying like, like, oh, it's just one of many Saviors. But they were trying to emphasize the importance of this is the Savior in the city of David, exactly where the Old Testament said it was going to happen, you know, in Bethlehem. That was David's city, right? David's hometown. It says a son of David, it, uh, a Savior uh, that is Christ, it, that is born to, born to you, telling the shepherds, even though you're not very high on the economic ladder, you are indeed included in this, he says. He says, it is Christ the Lord. And he says, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. You know, that's exactly what they found. They got there and they went, well, wait a minute. The angel out there in the field said there's going to be a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. There it is. You'll find lying in a manger. So, and then it says this. At that message, at that word right there, when they said, here is going to be evidence of what I'm telling you is true, that that is indeed the Christ child, because you're going to find it exactly as I have told you, the angel said. At the announcement of the Savior that is being born, all of a the sudden, there is a great company of heavenly hosts. A bunch of angels show up and surround this one angel, and they're all there praising God. That's the first thing up here, is the accolades. They were praising God. Look what it says. Suddenly a great company of hosts appeared with the angel, praising God. You know what I'm hoping one day? And, and hear me, and I'm, I'm not trying to offend. I, I am not a, a charismatic uh, guy, you know, if, if you if you're if you're charismatic in your worship, that's fine. That's a, that's totally up to you. I'm I'm a little bit, but I'm looking forward to the day when we can just praise God without any hindrance and without any fear. Amen. When we can just say, you know what, God, I'm just here to praise and worship you. I just want to hear and sing. I can't sing very well, but I'm going to sing from the top of my voice, Lord, just to praise you. And I and I may not be able to pray like some of those folks, but Father, when I pray to you, I'm just going to praise you through whatever communication you and I have. That is what it's about. These guys showed up and they said, we want to praise God. What does the Bible say? When Jesus was coming in, now, by the word, the Greek word there is aneo, uh, aneo. It means to speak of praise in, and it's always used, that particular word is always used in expressing the praise to God. Aneo. Uh, it comes, it, it's, the, it's the Luke chapter 19, verse 37, when it says, when he came near, this is talking about the triumphal entry of Jesus. You know, the week before he's going to go to the cross, he comes in. He's riding on that donkey and all that kind of stuff. And he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives. And the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to, what? Praise, aneo, God, in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Well, of course, they saw, I know what you're saying. You say, well, they saw miracles. That's worth praising God. You know what? You should praise God even when you don't see the miracles. Amen. Even when you don't see the extraordinary. Because quite frankly, <laughs> i got to tell you, every morning when I look in the mirror, I'm thinking, you belong to the king. You ain't much to look at, but you belong to the king. And I know you're going to drag a razor across that face and try to clean up best as you can, but you belong to the king. That in itself, friends, should give us enough motivation to say, Lord, I just want to praise you. Because if I was to, if I was to slice my throat with that razor right now accidentally and bleed out here in this bathroom, I'd go to be with you. Not that I want that to happen. I use a safety razor for that very reason. I'd go be with you in heaven. That in itself is a miracle. And that is worthy of praise. God, you saved me. 
I deserve death and hell. I deserve, I deserve a devil's, I deserve the hot, hot part of the devil's hell. And yet you found it in your grace to save me. That's worthy of adeo, of praise to God. And then you begin to count all the other things. I mean, just begin to think about all the things that you've enjoyed this morning. A church where you can come in and be safe. A place where you can come and in fellowship with one another. That people love you and welcome you and encourage you. All of that time. That is worthy of praise. But when these angels showed up and these heavenly hosts came out, they came to praise God. Not only did they can praise God, but also proclaiming glory. Look what it says. The angels came praising God and saying, and I want to emphasize the word saying, and it actually is the word saying. I know that we have heard angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains. That's not really biblical. I, I hate to be a bearer of bad news. They're not really singers. They're sayers. They speak out. They worship with praise. I probably just upset my music lady. Right there. <laughs> No, it's fine. No, it's fine. No, 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 no. no. It's, 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 it's totally fine. It's totally fine. I just want you to understand that the word there that they use is the word Lego. It's the word Lego, and it means to lay forth or to speak. In the beginning, John chapter 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning was what? The word. It's the same word, Lego. It was the laying forth of God's Son into this world. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 1, verse 1. So, I'm not trying to blow a hole in your theology, but just understand. that they use that word saying there in the NIV, they were accurate. They were saying, glory to God in the highest. Now, I'm sure those angelic voices were just about as amazing as anything you'll, any music you'll ever hear. But they were proclaiming God's glory. Glory, the word is doxa. Many of you in, in, in Bernice, you'll appreciate this. We used to sing the doxology. Remember, have you ever, anybody ever heard of the doxology? What's the first word there? Praise. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise. Doxa. It's a word that means praise. But it really, if you get down to the minutia, it starts out by, it means to have a good opinion. Now, I, I know opinions are like elbows. We've all got at least one of them, right? Okay, we, we got that. But it really means a good opinion in reference to his magnificence, excellence, preeminence, dignity, and grace. So when you're saying, praise God from whom all blessings flow, glory to God, when it says glory to the God in the highest, it's saying I am giving my good opinion of his eminence. I don't have to, get, I don't have to verify how amazing he is, but that's what I'm doing when I am proclaiming his glory. He is awesome. And I want that awesomeness to come from my voice to his ears and tell him, Lord, I praise you. And I worship you. Glory to God in the highest. And peace on earth to on men to whom his favor rests. Jesus would say in proclaiming his glory, he would say this, I have brought you glory, doxa. Actually, the word there is really dokadzo. It's a, it's a variation of that. It means to ascribe honor to God. He says, I have brought you glory. In other words, I have come and ascribed your uh, and honoring you for what you've done. I have brought you glory on earth. Why? By completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, and now, Father, glorify me. It's the same word, doxadzo, which means, now, Father, I'm asking you to ascribe the honor to me because I am God the Son, even though I've come to, to, to live and, to, to, and I'm going to die here in a very short period of time. I've done everything you asked me to do. Now I'm looking for you to give me back the glory. And, and, uh, it, it says, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory. Again, doxa, uh, I had before the beginning of the world. He says, God, I, I've come here. I've done the 33 years. I've, I've ministered. I've shared. I'm about to die. And I'm looking forward to coming back and being with you. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Incidentally, for those of you who might be reading the King James Version, it says, peace on earth and goodwill toward men. 
That's not really an accurate translation. I know, I'm sorry, I just got to tell you this. When I tell you this, you know, don't go out and key my car because right now it's not my car. I've had to borrow because mine. I just got mine back yesterday, by the way. My car is back. But don't keep my other friend's car, so I got to take it back today. So it says, uh, it really is peace on earth to him whose favor rests. It's not goodwill toward men because goodwill toward men means something that you and I can do. Showing goodwill. But what he's saying is, he says, glory to God and peace on earth. And peace on earth is because of what of his spirit resting on you and I as a result of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's different. That's a better translation. God's peace, listen to what one author said. This is Boulder. says this. He says, God's peace is not given to those who have goodwill, but to those who are recipients of God's goodwill or favor. That's why it says, peace on earth to men on whom his favor rests. What is grace? I've defined it before for you to say grace is God's unmerited favor. In other words, it's not a favor that we deserve. It's not anything we deserve. God has given it to us even though we haven't earned it. He says glory to God in the highest and peace on earth on whom his favor rests. Next time we get together, we'll talk more about the shepherds. But remember, angels are messengers. You may very well have a time where somebody comes to you and gives you a word, and it might very well be an angel that's simply being obedient to God. Don't worship that. Don't, don't give special uh, allowance to that. Acknowledge it for, for what it is. It will always be in agreement with the word of God. And then act on it, because that's exactly what the shepherds did here. When they got the announcement, when, when they got the... Uh, uh, when they got the uh, uh, announcement when they got the appearance, when they got the accolades. Sorry, I forgot my own outline for a second there. Uh, they acted on it. They went to Bethlehem. They saw for themselves. And then they went and told everybody else. Maybe that's what God's trying to tell us this year. We focused on so many things. Maybe we understand that there truly was a blessing proclaimed by God. That's Jesus Christ. And that's what the world needs to hear. That's what the world needs to hear. Think about that, would you? And to him be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, right now, I know, Bernice is going to start playing, so don't be alarmed. Father, I know that you wrote this down so we would know. I mean, it would have been easy, Lord, just to kind of say, okay, Jesus came and go on from there, but but Father, that's just part of the story. You, you orchestrated all of this to, to confirm for us all the promises given in the Old Testament of looking forward to Messiah and how every single one of them was fulfilled in Jesus. Father, just as the angels are messengers, may we too be messengers of the good news. And that it wouldn't just be good news for us, but be going news for everybody else. Father, people need the Lord. They don't need another social organization. They don't need another political party. They don't need some kind of new, uh, newfangled uh, philosophy or ideology. People need the Lord. So, Father, help us this Christmas season to be more passionate. That's the word we want to use, Father, passionate. Not aggressive, not mean-spirited, not screaming and yelling, but, Father, more passionate in sharing that precious good news that came down to those shepherds 2,000 years ago and has been going around the world ever since. Father, help us here at Four Winds Church to be an integral part of that. We praise you, Lord. We love you. May you be glorified in our actions and our words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Jeff Noble. You ever thought about what you're living for? Why you exist? What your purpose is? You know, a lot of folks ask that question. And we know where to find the answer. It's right in the Word of God, the book we call the Bible. If you'd like to find out more about what God has to say about things, then I'd invite you to come to Four Winds Church. 
We're meeting at 31840 West Seven Mile Road in Livonia. Our service times are 8.30 a.m. That's more of a traditional service. And then our 11 o'clock service is going to be more contemporary, a blending of traditional and contemporary music. If you'd like to see what God has to say about things, we invite you to come to Four Winds. If you'd like some more information, go to fourwindslove.org and you'll find out everything you need to know. I hope I'll see you Sunday. God bless.